I'm Luther Fred Graves, I'm 99 years old. I was born in uh, South Arkansas, uh, let's see, I don't remember the little old town, but it's a little old town down there in South Arkansas, 1920. When we landed in Phillips County, where I went to Barton School, and I was a coach on a basketball team, and we had a pretty good team. And the guy run his elbow up to my chin, cut a hole in my tongue, and they had to go with Alexa to get it sewed up. And the doctor didn't use no easy stuff. He he just sewed it up and said, "Go on back to school." And swell was so big, I couldn't talk. The teacher said, "You don't have to say nothing. I'll take care of it for you." And. Uh, A little bit before that, when I, when I was getting school ready to start, my brother put the water over to school. They didn't have no water. They had a path. You had to use a little house down there to go use the bathroom. Of course, they throwed lime in there to keep it from smelling. But he was the first one that they put water over to Barton School. That was around about 1937. Anyhow, that's been a long time ago. <laughs> well, we was farming and I, uh, they wanted me to do carpenter work. And I told Leon he could use my equipment to farm with. Well, he did, <clears throat> and farm commodities were so cheap, he didn't make it that far. And the bank closed him out and come and got all of my tractors and farm equipment and sold it to help pay his bill. <laughs> Him and Ray Dawson went down in the foreign country. They was raising the wheat down there. And they didn't know a bug got in that wheat and run up the stalk and eat it all. When they got the combines going down there, there they wasn't nothing to combine. <laughs> anyway, and that sold them out when they had to come home, get rid of all the farm equipment. <laughs> Cause she was always there for me. She stayed with me like, Oh, like my wife. I mean, she never would uh, out of my sight when we go to Oregon to go on a vacation and see my sister, Aunt Dorothy. And uh, when I was 16, <clears throat> I went to Memphis to join the Navy. Well, when I got over there, they did they just full up. And I... Uh, at that time, you could not thumb a ride on a highway. So uh, I walked across the bridge, coming back, and I thumbed the high road anyway to Far City. Well, when I got to Far City, I was going to walk from there to Barton, to the corner of Barton where we live. And uh, <clears throat> some and when I was walking down the highway in the curb of the, the highway, the state highway patrolman came along. He said, what you doing out here this time of night? And I told him, he said, well, get in. And he took me to Mariana and gave me enough money to buy a bus. That's when they had bus, buses running up and down the highway to go on to Barton. He was a really nice guy. And uh, after then, I went went to work on the farm. And when the war came out, my brother and I were in Oklahoma deer hunting. And we came back, I turned the radio on the car, and all hell had broke loose because they'd done bombed Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> 
my brother said, we better go home. I'm fixing to get drafted. And we did. And as soon as he got here, he lived uh, close to Aubrey, Arkansas. Anyway, when we got here, next week, well, they shipped him on out. Well, he went in the Army, and they put him into Fort Knox, guarding the gold. So I talked to him over there, and he said, Ooh, I'm guarding enough gold to furnish the whole United States. Then the first thing you know, they shipped him to the war zone, and uh, he helped chase Rommel all the way across North Africa. And he uh, told me one day they was getting pretty close, and they hit a mud hole and bulked all that. He's in a 701st heavy tank destroyer battalion. And when they got there, they bogged down, they couldn't go. And the captain told them, every man for himself. He said he sold the machine gun over his shoulder and took off. And he made it when he came back home and hit me farm a little after the war. When he came home, I told him, I said, well, the war is going to be over for. I was stationed at Millington. Uh, I said, well, I need to go to war. I was just at about that age, I guess. But anyway, I came home one weekend to see uh, Leon as my youngest son. He was born while I was over in Millington out in the field up there close to Moro. They didn't have no hospital, no doctor. No doctor would come. Well, a doctor came out and gave birth to him up there close to Moro. And uh, after then, well, I, they just give me a weekend uh, privilege to come see him. I went back, and when I got back, they had my bag packed to go to San Francisco to catch ship. Well, <clears throat> when I got to San Francisco, they had lost my clothes, but finally they got them <laughs> shipped out there. And uh, of course, we rolled them all up like you're supposed to. And about a week after then, they they was building a ship, a new ship. What the number was, AK-137. A fellow, AK-137, which was a tack carbo ship. And we got, wasn't supposed to make but one trip because the Japs were sinking all the supply ship coming out in the Pacific. But anyway, we went, got on the ship, and the first islands that we hit, we had four of those LST landing crafts on that ship. The uh, first island we hit was Mariana Islands. And the biggest island was named Kwajalein. Well, we hit the island and it had four of these landing crafts and we t took um, supplies over to the troop that's already there on the island anyway. We got there and I sort of looked around. I saw this fence post, which the Navy had laid out there on the edge and shut all the coconut trees down. And I thought it's fence post. But anyhow, I put this in there. When the war was over, the, our government had to pay for the coconut trees. I don't know which country owned them, I think. I don't know if the British or somebody else owned them. That country, maybe the French, but anyway, after that, they let us have a little leisure time. Right? Well, when I went on, we went took the supplies over to the troops, and I went with them to help them with it. 
and when we got over there, here come the Japanese uh, suicide plane, and he was spraying the ground. You could see the bullets hitting the ground. Well, they had already, the troops had already pushed a trench out over there, and everybody was running, diving into the trench. And I said, well, it looked like sense to me. And so I did the same thing, which saved my butt. And uh, anyway, uh, on that island, I took a Japanese sword and a Japanese louver off of a Japanese officer. And going back to the ship, one of the guys uh, sitting up on the side, he said, I want to see that sword. I let him look at it. When the, sh the water was rolling quite a bit, it's either him go overboard or the sword. So he just throwed the sword overboard. I think by now they think they say that sword was about, I think about thirty-five thousand, but it's gone. It went to the bottom of the ocean out there. But I did bring the Japanese lever back, and he kept it around for a while. But. Uh, After that, after we come off of the Mariana Islands, we went on to the South Pacific, different islands. There's several, I didn't know there that many islands out in the South Pacific. But there's, a, there's so many out there, I don't remember all the names. But uh, we were out there masking for invasion of Okinawa. And uh, it was all a secret naval base. They said it was. But it wasn't secret because they had all the British and all the English and all American fleets. All the ships was in there masking for invasion of Okinawa. Well, while we were in there, they had a, a storm. And the, the commander of the base said, every ship that prepare for sea, and God bless you. We hit that storm, a typhoon, and our ship was taking 45 degree rolls. It only took 46 to turn it over. And during that storm, the Navy lost 123 ships. Most of them were small, but there were three destroyers in all hand. But you cannot say anything what happened out there during the war. And nobody back here ever knew about it, I don't imagine. But anyway, that is exactly what happened. When we got them all back in there in the next, day, the next couple of days, we masked and headed out to Okinawa. Well, when we got there, we hit uh, hit the beach, and uh, of course, the Marines and the Army had done pretty well cleaning the, the beach off right 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 at the beach anyway. And we went ashore and went up. And a little native kid was up there, and we asked him, well, how many times did the airplane fly over here? He said, one thing. <laughs> he cleaned it all off. They put a little bomb and everything on there. Well, they had the Army Air Force, Navy Air Force. They had all the planes coming in there. That was one thing that I was really proud of. Well, you be out there and you hear planes are coming and you look up and see U.S. owning planes. And that made me one happy person for those planes to be on one, one Japanese plane. From there, we were a sinister Auckland, New Zealand. And we down, went down through the canal, Panama Canal. The canal. 
And uh, anyway, we were in convoy headed down the, the canal. Let's see, is the, I don't, com but it was a famous shipping lane. But anyway, they, uh, we were in this convoy, and the Japanese had the suicide subs in there. They hit a ship, the last ship in the convoy, and uh, sank it. Well, we it didn't bother us because we were the head, head of that ship. And uh, we went on to, we went down there, and the guys, the Japanese had killed all the men folks there in that town. And of course, some women were sitting out on the beach waiting for the Navy to come. And we come, came in, and they had these periscopes on the Navy. And all of them jumped on the periscope, watching for the women out there, which they didn't have no underclothes on. <laughs> they were ready for the Navy to come in. Well, the commanding officer went over and he got up a uh, state party for that night. It would give us a little leisure time, and he had a big crowd and a big time. And uh, anyhow, the next couple of days, we headed out, had a load, headed back, war material, headed back to the first night we pulled in. Uh, I think it was a British Hell Island. And all the guys, they took a trip. They seen the army store over there. And they run over there and they wanted to buy some stuff from the army. Well, they lined up. And here come a guy walking up there. Got in front. Well, the guy worked on my ship in the Navy, when I was on ship, he just got the guy by the shoulder and turned around, laid him on the ground. Well, he happened to be a two-star general. <laughs> and you're not supposed to hit a general during the war, they can shoot you. And uh, we all got on the ship and headed back that, that night. They sent a message to our ship. It says, as soon as you land, Send this guy back to this island for military laws or something. Anyway, we did. When we got to the first stop, they had a big PP, PBY plane sitting there running, waiting to pick this guy up to take him back. And uh, he went to court. <clears throat> And they was fixing to sentence him. And he says, well, look here. I did not know who that man was because we had been out to sea for two years. And we hadn't seen no arm and nobody. <laughs> they believed it, which was true. And they sent him back home to America and they... They discharged him because they believed his story, and that's exactly what happened. Of course, he was an honest person, you know. Sure. Now, I was uh, at Anna Weetok when they flew the atomic bomb in. It a South Pacific Island, and it was the most sickly, secret, highly thing that the military ever had. Nobody would know it's coming, and... Uh, after it left, we headed to San Francisco to get a load of military supplies. Cause we didn't know, that we thought maybe them planes would get shot down, but they didn't. And when the war ended, we were about halfway from San Francisco, from the island to San Francisco. And they turned us around 
sent us to the to Babio in the Philippines. Anyway, when they got to the Philippines, we had to spend a couple of nights there, and there's so many natives there, uh, I mean monkeys, at night they'd come and steal your razor and <clears throat> run off in the jungle. The jungle was so thick, when you got three or four feet of them, you couldn't see nobody in no way. Late 1936, moved down to Barton, Arkansas, and uh, My uh, uncle was the one that had us come up there, and they unloaded us there at his yard. We was going we live with him for a while, and I stepped off in the mud about ankle deep, and I said, "Oh, take me back to close to Nashville, Arkansas, so I can walk on that gravel barefoot." <laughs> and I didn't like it here at all with it. But I had a bicycle and we made it. And uh, it started raining. It rained and rained and rained. It kept raining. And the Mississippi River came up. And it was the top of the concrete levees in Helena. And when the wind blowed, the water would splash over the levee. And they were getting up people to lay sandbags all down through, on top of the levee, down through that way. And uh, my brother and I happened to be down there that day, and, and we seen what they're doing, so we took up, came home because we lived out Barton. But uh, the the levee held, and it did not break there, <clears throat> but. That was, uh, well, I can remember, that was 1937. And it was quite a flood. That's when they still had the, the ferry there to carry the train across the river to go down through Mississippi. And, uh, which, uh, of course, after them, the water began to recede a little, but it did not break that hell. They were just lucky, I guess. Yeah, I was going to tell you about when we was out in the Pacific, when we was going down a place to get ready, we were all in a, what they call a secret naval base. It wasn't no secret because the planes, the suicide planes came in. We had all the Navy and all the uh, English and all the Italian ships in there. And they hit a big aircraft carrier right behind us. It was brand new and it just came in from the States getting rid of that invasion for Okinawa. But it, Make a long story short, uh, on that aircraft carrier, they, they, they had brand new planes on it and they shot them off in the water. Cause every time that far would hit one of them, it'd explode and set another far. And uh, then after them, after we got to the Okinawa, they, we were going down to basking for some more islands anyway. They stopped in at New Hebrides, and we happened to have a ammunition ship in there. And the Japanese hit it with a uh, suicide submarine, a small one. They had no small ones out there. And they sank everything they could get a hold of. And uh, when they hit that ammunition ship, was all all the ships were in the lagoon there. And of course, it, when it blew that ammunition ship up, it was so hot down there like it is out here today. Most of the guys were on top side. And when that ammunition ship went off, it blew them off, all off in the water. <laughs> but 
that finally, that finally come to an end like everything else did out there, eventually. And uh, after then we left, that was before we went to Auckland, New Zealand. And coming back from Auckland, New Zealand, uh, that's what he would do. We came back uh, at night time, right by Iwo Jima. That's about pretty close to the time they was raising the flag. But we did not stop and go in. We just came right by it and kept, kept barreling ass, I guess you call it. <laughs> anyway. And, uh, there's so many islands out there in the Pacific, I don't think one ship could ever visit them all, but we visited a bunch of them. And it, when we first went out there, they told us they just made our ship to make one trip because the Japanese were sinking all the cargo ships that came out there because they were supplying the, the invasion forces, you know. And... Uh, that pretty well. Oh, uh, I was going to tell you too, and that island we hit, Mariana Island. After the after it's sort of over, calm down. They let us go on the beach, walk around. They had uh, these little ocean shells along the beach. They were beautiful. I don't know what to call them, but I picked up a bunch of them, brought them back home. I don't know, I guess when the house burnt, well, they burnt, all burnt up. What's your secret to making it to 99 years old? Do what? What's your secret to making it 99 years old? Don't do no drinking and very little chasing women. <laughs> anyway. When I came back here, I was working for um, the middle of the lumber company. They wanted to harm me. They wanted to build a housing project. We built them a housing project on north of Mariana. I think 40 houses at one time. So I just had nine carpenter crews at one time. Of course, we got them all built now. If anybody ever wants to see it, they Drive north of Maryland and turn, turn across the road down and see where all that housing project is. They all still standing. It's a miracle. <laughs> Middle of Lumber Company was a high energy place in Lee County at that time. You know, their pay was more than one person's pay will, payroll and then of course in Lee County. And, uh, it was a nice place to work. When I, when I moved back to Barton, that was before I went to the Navy, I was going to Barton School. I played the guitar and uh, I'd get out there and play the guitar and, and I'd get on the stage and play the guitar. And, of course, all the kids, I was just a regular Elvis, you know. They'd start screaming and clapping and hollering. <laughs> it was, that's our Barton School. That was something else, I tell you, for sure. Then, uh, during that storm, I mean, during that flood, uh, they built a pavilion there. And we'd go down there on Saturday night and play music for the folks. Anyway, that's been a long time ago, too. Most everything I did has been a long time ago. Would you would you say they were the good old days? I would say them was the good old days because most of the decent things are going on around here, you know. Now you can't even go out at night hardly. It's pitiful. That's the only time that I really tried to get a ride mm -hmm. when I was coming back from Memphis, you know. I, Going to say, couldn't join the Navy because we don't have no spot. 
when I went over to join when the war was on, didn't even stop. Went by the, the recruiting station, picked up a ticket. They were sending me direct to Millington to take a, start taking the uh, training, you know. And when we got through at Millington, they sent us back to Memphis, Naval Air Station. And uh, when we got back there, we were hip training pilots to go to war. And one of the uh, guys asked me, he said, come on, go riding with me. Well, I went with him. There were three planes took off together, and they uh, they'd be flying along straight. First thing you know, you'd be looking up, you'd see the ground. And <laughs> I said, "Well, now when he gets in, and if he takes off again, I'm going to jump out because I had an air uh, uh, suit on, you know, the jumping suit for the Navy." Anyway, when he landed, he had one of the wheels locked. It flipped the plane around to part of the yang off, wing off. I said, well, to myself, I said, now if he gets up there, I'm going to jump out. But he, he shut it down just before he took off. Could, but he didn't have one wing. He wouldn't have went anywhere for it anyway. <laughs> I was going to tell you too, every time they had a the ship, what they call when they said, uh, man, all battle station, you, uh, you, that's when you went to a place, they signed you where the guns was, anything to fight a war with, that's where you had to go while while that man you battle station was on, you know. Every time you got in the war zone, well, they call them man you battle station. But most of them on that ship was huge guns. And uh, they ordered us to go up to the front. And the old man called the Pentagon, the White House, we ain't got the guns to go up there. Well, the next morning they had us in in dry dock, putting the guns on them, the pom pom guns to shoot down the Japanese suicide planes, you know. And then they sent us on up front then. But I'm lucky to be back because they, they sunk a lot of our ships out there. Yeah, you went through a lot of our men. And when we pulled in at Pearl Harbor, uh, we pulled in there right after them. They sank all them ships. And uh, they were turned up sideways, little pitiful. And uh, I hope nothing like that ever happens to the United States again.